Hello. I hope you're doing well. Tonight we are going to be looking at this art book, which is called Essential Surrealists by Tim Martin, which I got for £4.99 from Oxfam. It was a good find. I found this in Oxfam, which is a charity shop, if you don't know. Um, I found this last December, and decided I had to take it home. Surrealist art is some of my favorite art, and I love these kinds of books. They're usually a little too expensive for me to afford new, so it's nice to find them in charity shops where they're a bit more affordable. So I thought we'd just take a look and see what we learn. I'm going to read you what it says on the inside here. It says, Essential Surrealists. To describe an event or experience as surreal today is to adopt a familiar figure of speech. The word conjures up ideas of the weird and the wonderful, of disjointedness and disorientation, of the inexplicable and the unfamiliar. Worlds in which fish swim through the sky, or inanimate objects metamorphose into living beings. These images, often more in tune with the world of dreams and nightmares than with everyday life, perhaps originate less in our own imagination than in drawings, paintings, and sculptures produced by a group of artists working predominantly in the period between the two world wars. Essential Surrealists examines the work of the Surrealists in detail, from the early artistic influence of Henri Rousseau, to the paintings of household names such as Magritte and Miro, to later and more obscure works. It is a pretty good overview of Surrealist art. I'm not sure how much they succeeded at the uh, more obscure works thing. It's kind of my one complaint, is they don't include a lot of the, um, lesser-known surrealists. Um, this was published in 1999. It's a great book. This is the table of contents that lists all the different paintings that are, um, shown and written about. Each painting gets its own little page with uh, a description that kind of talks about the context and sometimes influences of other artists and a little bit of like interpretation occasionally. Um, so there's a lot to learn from this book. As you can see here, they've included um, multiple paintings by each artist. Which is great to get sort of an overview of like each artist's work, but as I say, it doesn't leave a lot of room for um, more obscure artists. But that's okay. So, it's a nice long introduction here, which we'll skip for now. The uh, print quality is really good as well. Really impressed with how well the paintings look. I have been printed. That sentence didn't make sense. <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, yeah, they've been printed really well and they all look very vibrant. Um, sorry about this glare. There's not much I can do, unfortunately. I don't have very good lighting in here, but sorry. <laughs> so they start with some paintings by artists like Rousseau who wouldn't necessarily 
normally be considered a surrealist um, but whose paintings definitely had an influence on surrealist art and have sort of surreal elements to them Let's see what it has to say about this one This is The Dream from 1910 This is one of my favorites of uh, Rousseau's It's so vibrant and beautiful And it says the Surrealists admired the work of Henri Rousseau, although he died in 1910. He was a Sunday painter without any formal training who aspired to paint in the style of the French Academy. The Surrealists admired his extremely personal style, even if Rousseau himself did not. As he painted every detail, the result was not academic realism, but a dreamlike style, rich in color. Rousseau claimed to have seen such sights while in Mexico, and th though this was probably not true, he was a regular visitor to Paris's botanical gardens, where he studied exotic plants and tropical vegetation. In this picture, Rousseau has depicted a variety of jungle animals lurking with menace or hiding in fear. The reclining female nude remains calm and secure, like a primitive fertility goddess enthroned in her flourishing kingdom. Even the lions seem tamed by her gaze and gesture. Her round sculptural forms recall a long tradition in European painting, while the proportions of her body evoke the art of non-European cultures, such as those of Mexico or Africa. Although this painting has the quality of a scene painted from life, it represents a glimpse of heightened reality, filled with symbolic characters that stems from a very personal, almost eccentric, imagination. And here we have Giorgio de Quirico. I think that's how you pronounce that. This painting is called The Uncertainty of the Poet, which could be the title of my autobiography. This one, um, let's see what it has to say about this one. The Futurist Movement, which also flourished in Italy at this time, so this was in 19 looked to France and to Cubism. De Crico, however, looked to the Renaissance and ancient Roman art. What made his work avant-garde was the manner in which he distorted the classical and Renaissance sense of calm, balance, and harmony, as can be seen in the Roman villa. Ancient Italian art idealized the human figure, depicting a rational world in which the viewer could feel confident and optimistic. De Crico introduced distortions into apparently rational scenes, and in so doing, made his pictures seem more worried and disturbing. The uncertainty of the poet has made an unexpected juxtaposition of a twisted, classical female torso with a bunch of bananas. This combination suggests many diverse interpretations, yet remains enigmatic and dreamlike something I really appreciate about surrealist art is the way it feels like it's kind of tapping into the dream world, the subconscious. I know a lot of people think that surrealism is just sort of randomness and uh, sort of being abstract for the sake of being abstract, but to me anyway, surrealist art is sort of more, sort of a better representation of the human experience than more traditional art sometimes, to me anyway. I like all the different um, geometric shapes in these ones. All the clean lines. I 
there's the, uh, the Roman villa again. Bigger this time. I love the colors in this. That yellow is amazing. It's so bright, vivid. These blues. Surrealist art is how closely it is linked with comedy. <laughs> I'm a big fan of sort of like more surrealist comedy as well, sort of abstract comedy. And I appreciate a bit of humor in my art. Where's the one? There we go. I knew it had to be in here. The fountain. It always makes me laugh. We have Picasso, another artist who wouldn't be considered a surrealist, but whose art definitely had sort of surrealist elements and inspired the surrealists. This is Girl in a Chemise from 1905. Picasso painted Girl in a Chemise some ten years before his development of Cubism. The picture's clear debt the symbolist movement of the late 19th century places it as an early surrealist work. Prompted by the death of his friend Carlos Casacemus, Casacemus, sorry, Picasso painted a number of pictures of outcasts, impoverished musicians, and beggars, later calling this gloomy period of his youth his blue period. This sad and tender portrait of a young woman, thin, underfed, yet beautiful despite her poverty, is a late blue period work. In Weeping Woman, 1937, Picasso had lost this tenderness and realism. There is a compassion and melancholy in this work, evoked by a backdrop of cool blue, the delicate modeling, and the artist's supreme skill. The face is slightly exaggerated, much in the manner of Toulouse-Lautrec, though its serenity also recalls the faces of classical Greek and Roman art. The elongated limbs and metallic light are reminiscent of 16th century Spanish mannerist painters such as El Greco. Picasso does not experiment with the forms of painting, but strives to create emotional to read about art more than I hear it spoken about, you know? <laughs> we have Francis Picabia. This one is called Spanish Night. This image was used as the cover of the review magazine Literature, probably Literature, published in November 1922. Picabia made a considerable contribution to the formation of Surrealism at this time, partly through his attacks on the Dada movement. Along with André Breton, whose work was also published in Literature, he sought a more serious and less anarchic art. While Dada celebrated freedom, it was seen to be useless in bringing about social change, real social change. It had become a noisy protest movement, while what was wanted following the war was a serious force for altering art and society. Picabia's claim that Dada was dead, with Surrealism its successor, was a claim to which many listened with interest and respect. In his painting, Picabia sought to create a controlled form of drawing, based upon recent work by Picasso, which some have called Surrealist Classicism. Elements of this are still evident in Picasso's The Three Dancers. 
He used the simple, geometrically sharp style of this drawing in his designs for ballet costumes used by the experimental groups Ballet Suédois, whose performances featured music by Eric Satie. Someone told me once that Satie used to... I can't remember quite what they said. I think they said he used to wear a velvet suit every day, and he always carried an umbrella. <laughs> I don't remember in what context that was told to me. <laughs> or if I'm even remembering that correctly, but there you go. Random trivia for you. That might not be true. <laughs> I love the colors in this one well. It was amazing. It's a texture to it. Oh wow, look at that. Head and winged horse, 1928. Winged horse, so I assume these are meant to be wings. But it's interesting because wings usually look so gentle and airy and soft and light. Whereas these ones almost look menacing a bit. You know, they kind of look like knife blades. They almost look like they're made out of metal, sort of heavy. I also appreciate that when they mention art in one of these descriptions that relates to the piece that they're talking about, they put a little smaller image of what they're referencing so you don't have to like go flicking back and forth. It's nice. Andre Masson, Panique. That red is incredible, wow. I'm obsessed with color. Um, I love really vibrant colors, and I'm not even necessarily vibrant, just, I don't know, I love color. Um, I'm not an artist, but I often wish I was, just so I could play around with different colors. <laughs> that would be amazing, that would be the best part. I don't care about the shapes, just let me play with different colors. <laughs> Max Ernst. I love this painting. I used to live in London, and I would go to the Tate Modern quite often, and hang out with the surrealist art. <laughs> so I saw this one quite often. Says this was one of Ernst's first large scale surrealist paintings, with its deceptively simple composition dominated by a single centrally placed elephant. <laughs> element. <laughs> elephant, too, though. Its meticulous brushwork allowed him to render sensuous surfaces that are disturbingly empty inside, much like de Grieco's mannequin. of my sister. <laughs> Surrealist paintings have the best titles as well. The Meeting of Friends. I love this one. At the First Clear Word, 1923. The colors again, just amazing. Lovely contrast of the blue and the orange. There's a lot of Ernst in here. That green. Wow. It's beautiful. I love 
surrealist paintings like this that have just so much detail. The ones where you could sort of look at them on a bunch of different occasions and see something different every time. Oh, I really like that. But it's kind of, it's always a different experience. And I appreciate that they've included some different media as well, so it's not just paintings necessarily. Ooh, Miro. I love Miro. I love the colors again. And the shapes are just wonderful. These really strangely elegant abstract shapes. Just so cool. Lovers is also the title of my favorite Magritte painting, actually. Ten points to you if you can guess why that's my favorite Magritte painting. Bull race. Woman and bird in moonlight. I guess they're pulling it back to Rousseau there. We have Jean Arp. Arp. Don't know how else you'd say that. I really like this one. It's called Configuration from the 1920s. It says, as with many of the Surrealists, Arp began to move away from Dada after the First World War. He went to live in Paris, although he continued to keep in contact with many different European art movements, including the German abstract painters and the De Stijl group in Holland. He experimented extensively with abstract painting and sculpture, often using cut-out wood and card to build up a shallow sculptural surface. His wife, Sophie Taubert, was an abstract painter who used straight lines and geometric forms, but he preferred the natural, organic line, a biomorphic shape. In configuration, Arp used irregular vertical strip stripes of blue-gray and black to create a background of shifting space and depth. Down the central strip, oval and organic white shapes float with innocence generated with spontaneity. This one kind of reminds me of a Christmas ornament. You know the ones that have like the spiral? shiny ones. Salvador Dali is my favorite surrealist painter. Maybe my favorite artist? I don't know, it's hard to say. 
close second for surrealist painters anyway is Leonora Carrington, who is sadly not mentioned in this book. Well, she might be mentioned somewhere in like some of these descriptions, but they don't have any of her art, which is too bad. She has really wonderful, um, detailed paintings, which would be nice to look at, sort of close up, printed like this. She was a wonderfully bizarre soul. <laughs> if you don't know her work and you like surrealist art, you should go look her up. Anyway, Dolly is uh, sort of the master of surrealism, wasn't he? <laughs> he says he was fond of reading texts by Freud and to Croft Ebbing about unusual sexual perversions. Yeah, of course he was. Also says that he studied Freud's ideas on the meanings of dreams and liked the suggestion that unpleasant childhood memories were pushed down from the conscious mind into an unconscious. It's a typo there. <laughs> there are definitely some surrealist paintings that remind me of like specific dreams that I've had. I have really vivid um, sort of story-like dreams. And I can still remember, like, really vividly certain scenes from them. And there are definitely some surrealist paintings that remind me of those dreams. Persistence of memory. Everyone knows this one. The melting clocks. I don't think they have my favorite Dali painting in here, though, which is a shame. Although I do love the burning giraffe. Yeah, no, that's the end of the deli section. So I'll just tell you about it instead. My favorite deli painting is um, The Metamorphosis of Narcissus. And like I said, when I lived in London, I used to go to the Tate a lot, Tate Modern. And it was usually to visit The Metamorphosis of Narcissus. I love that painting. I really loved living in London and getting to go to the Tate Modern whenever I liked. The first time I ever visited London and went to the Tate, I remember like this, well, for lack of a better word, this really surreal moment of seeing art that I'd only seen like in books on the internet. Seeing it in real life was just crazy. Like I'd been to art museums and art galleries, but nothing that ever had anything very famous in it. So I think the first one that kind of took my breath away was uh, Mondrian. It was like one of the first ones we saw when we walked in, and I just, I don't know, it just blew my mind that there it was, it was real. <laughs> and, I don't know, if you like art and you go to like art museums and stuff, you'll know what I mean when I say that sometimes you just have a, like a personal connection with certain works of art. If you've never experienced that, I guess it might sound a little weird. I feel like ten years ago, if someone had said that to me, I'd be like, what are you talking about? But a lot of paintings kind of have their own presence. And you really can feel a connection with them, and for whatever reason, I really feel a connection with um, the metamorphosis of Narcissus. Um, yeah, and that's one of those paintings that you kind of see something different every time you look at it. Speaking of having connections with paintings, if you're ever in London, go to the Tate Modern and go to, I think it's the floor that has most of the surrealist art actually, I can't remember, but there's a room, it's kind of just off the, uh, the main like central area with all the stairs, the elevators and stuff. Um, and it's also next to a Monet, I think, so there's like lots of people walking by to look at the Monet. But there's this little room that's kind of tucked away, and it is the Rothko room. And that is my favorite room in all of London. <laughs> if you're ever in London, please go. Unless you like hate Rothko, which I guess a lot of people do. Um, 
one of the reasons that's my favorite room in, in the Tate in, in London is because uh, there's usually not very many people in there. Um, and it's very dimly lit, and on hot days it's nice and cool, and on cold days it's nice and warm and safe. It's really quiet, you know, there's a lot of people walking past, but you can only really hear them well enough to just know that there's other people there, and, you know, you're safe, and there's other people going by and living their lives, and everything's okay. Rothko's paintings... I kind of dismissed them before seeing them in person. But in person, they really do have this just stunning presence. They're so, so massive that they kind of, they almost like look down on you. And I always used to feel like whatever I was feeling, whenever I saw them, they kind of like would reflect that back to me, that emotion. Not in like a judgmental way, but in a very like understanding, almost sort of patient way. I don't know if that makes any sense. It might sound <laughs> a little weird, but go sit in the Rothko room, especially on a rainy day. It's a wonderful place. I also have um, Kurt Schwitters. I'm not sure if it's Schwitters or Schwitters. Probably Schwitters. Some of his um, collage art. Opened by Customs. There was one in particular I was looking at earlier that I really liked. Which one was it? This one. From 1923. Let's read what it says. In looking at a Schwitter's collage, it is the materials that the viewer first notices. In this sense, style was a secondary matter. It soon also becomes apparent that the individual items of the collage have been chosen for their aesthetic beauty. The placing of the different parts was determined by each part. Thus, there is no underlying predetermined structure. The coherence of each construction depended on the chance character of each piece. Perhaps for this reason, one of the greatest pleasures of this collage is in imagining the process of its making. In reconstructing this process, the viewer can enjoy both the references made by each piece of paper to tickets, letters, and newspapers, and the sense of integrity in their assembly. By 1923, Schwitters had started to move away from his association with Dada towards the constructivists, artists such as Rodchenko, Mondrian, and Theo van Doisberg. In this particular work, his new interest was reflected in the more geometric edges and placement of each element. But, as before, it is interesting to look at the words in his collages. Here, there is a newspaper article on vampires, and a fragment bearing the last letters of Schwitter's name. I nearly um, applied to do a PhD in English literature, um, and my sort of proposal idea was to look at words in visual art, as well as um, visual art in poetry sort of that gray area between the two, because there's a lot of, like, visual poetry that some people would maybe class as visual art, and there's a lot of visual art that has words that um, could be read or sort of restructured as poetry. So I was really interested to look at the sort of gray area there between the two. It wasn't a very well-fleshed-out idea, <laughs> but I don't know. could have been cool, maybe. Someone else do it so I can read your thesis. <laughs> I really like collage art. I used to do some collages occasionally. I still do, I guess, sometimes, but 
not as regularly as before. I should start again. I really like collecting random little pieces of paper to use in collages. <laughs> that's, that's the fun part, is collecting the different things. Making the collages is pretty fun, too. I should get into that again. I also have Yakometti. I really like his sculptures. They must have some of the... Oh, that one's cool. The cage. This reminds me of those puzzles. Um, where it's like a little sphere that's like trapped inside. And a, like a cube and then another cube. And it's like been carved out of one piece of wood. I don't know if anyone knows what I mean. <laughs> you see like videos of them on Reddit being carved. Or like made with... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what kind of tools they used to make those. Anyway. A standing Woman from 1930. I love these really elegant, thin sculptures. I don't know, they're just beautiful. Lots of texture. I'm tying it back to Picasso. Very cool. Magritte. I also love Magritte. This is The Lost Jockey from 1926. Let's see what they have to say about this one. This early painting was of great importance to the Belgian painter René Magritte, as it captured for the first time his search for a poetic idea. In this work, he abandoned his study of painting itself with all its problems of creating the illusion of form and space. Instead, he turned to address the question of how a painting might produce a sense of mystery. He discovered in effect how to make a painting that could speak about more than just painting. The jockey has been placed in a forest made of turned wooden spindles, or bill bouquet as are typically found on stairs or tables. These strange wooden forms are full of suggestive association. They are phallic as well as evocative of chess pieces, trees, furniture, or isolated and lonely figures. That's how I've always seen them, as people. Magritte repeatedly used the image of a jockey in his works to suggest an anxious, racing state of mind. An urgency of emotion. It also suggests risk and gambling in its tension with the background of the calm, motionless forest that watches the jockey's search. The crisp rendering of the objects suggests a clear understanding of their form and function. Yet as a founder of Belgian surrealism, Magritte has used this style to attack rational thought and painterly skill. Sleeper. Classic. I love that this is called Betrayal of Images. <laughs> it's such a great name. This is another one that's at the Tate Modern, I think. It's either this one or a very similar one. I really like this sort of white kind of lattice pattern here, this sort of structure. I don't, I don't know, I'm just kind of entranced by it. it it's, it's quite strange, it doesn't really have any shadows or depth or anything, and it's just sort of superimposed. It almost looks like digital, which obviously it wasn't. But, um, yeah, it's very Again, for lack of a better word, very surreal. <laughs> you don't really see things like that in everyday life that just have no shadow or anything. It's quite strange. It almost looks like something that hasn't like rendered properly in a game or something. <laughs> this makes me 
makes me think of Cousin It. The Wells of Truth. Another classic, The Great War, 1964. Magritte often painted a bowler-hatted man, as seen in Pan, God of the Night, who stands upright, stiff, and without expression or emotion. Sometimes this man, who can be regarded as a portrait of the artist, appears in pairs or in groups. I would say he's appearing more in apples in this. That's a bad joke. This man is anonymous, part of the crowd, and an awkward but sympathetic character. In the Great War, Magritte once again shows us this man on the edge of catastrophe. His eyes, however, do not meet ours because of the sudden and unexpected appearance of a ripe apple. An impending tragedy is expressed through an everyday object that cuts off our view. There are two canvases entitled The Great War. The second depicts a woman dressed in a fine white embroidered dress with matching hat and umbrella. A bouquet of blue flowers conceals her face. In Magritte's world, the man must endure a strange set of affairs which he is powerless to change. The artist once said, I don't believe the man decides anything. I think that we are responsible for the universe, but that does not mean that we decide anything. interesting. I've never seen this painting as being like any sense of danger or threat or anything. I've seen it as very like peaceful and still. I guess the idea is he's about to be hit in the face with the apple, but I've really never seen it that way. I've seen it more of just the apple just floating, and just sort of serene, I guess. I don't know. Disasters of Mysticism. This is so cool. 1942. It says he was born in 1911 and still and is still alive, but this book was published in 1999. So this is really futuristic. Kind of looks like something you'd see in like a sci-fi film. It's very cool. really cool. Paul Nash, Landscape from a Dream. This is beautiful. In Britain, surrealism had a mixed reception. Although many artists and critics reacted hostily, Paul Nash, who trained at the Slade School, was widely accepted as an artist of worth. He was official artist in both the First and Second Wars, and the latter despite his interest in surrealism. Initially, he wanted to be a landscape painter, but began to experiment with cubism and constructivism. After seeing works by de Chirico, he began to paint objects in isolated settings. Nash's work was then admired by the French surrealists, who saw in it some of the intensity of de Chirico's early metaphysical paintings, and was invited to show in their 1936 London exhibition. Nash began Landscape from a Dream after the exhibition, meaning to return to his initial interest in landscape. The result was a seaside scene set with enigmatic objects from his earlier work. He sought the qualities of dreams and the unconscious, as was usual in the Surrealist works. To intensify this effect, he used mirrors and painting within a painting. Britain produced a number of artists and critics who were influenced by Surrealism. This group kept their links with European Surrealism throughout the war. 
the results of the links were visible well into the post-war period in the works of such artists as Henry Moore and Francis Bacon. Chagall, the poet reclining. Look at those sunset colors. Mm, I like this. Although his work seems inspired by automatism and free association, it was not. He disliked this method and its claim to uncover the working of the unconscious. As he said, for my part, I have slept well without Freud. and Pollock. Alchemy. This painting was one of a series prepared by Jackson Pollock for an exhibition that left the New York art world stunned and bemused. Pollock demonstrated his break with figurative painting by burying loosely drawn figures under a dense network of dripped lines made while laying the canvas on the floor. This technique, which earned him the nickname of Jack the Dripper, <laughs> recorded the artist's gestures through its delicate skeins and pools. Pollock limited his use of color in order to emphasize gesture, line, and the literal surface yet removed any trace of direct contact between the artist and the canvas. Seen from the right distance, these abstract paintings shifted from total flatness to an illusion of spatial depth. The appearance of space in the paintings, made by lines that never enclosed anything, led an increasing number of critics to hail them as the triumph of American painting. While Pollock's strip paintings clearly owe a debt to surrealist interests in painting the unconscious, using techniques of automatic writing and chance composition, they are not illustrations in the manner of Dali or Tanguy. Among the surrealists, only Arp and Miro used abstraction so boldly. you've enjoyed this. If you're still awake and you did like this video, please leave a like or a comment. I would really appreciate it. And subscribe if you'd like to. Do what feels right. I wish you pleasant dreams and a good night's sleep.